Car Con Carne live from quarantine on a Monday night. It's Quarantine Con Carne, sponsored tonight by C&H Financial Services. As business owners open back up to serve their communities, they're faced with a lot of challenges as they navigate through this new normal brought on by the coronavirus. C&H Financial Services, they're here to help. They offer a variety of products that range from traditional merchant accounts to a zero-cost payment processing solution, which eliminates the expense associated with accepting Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express as a form of customer payment. Hope everything's okay over there. CNH Financial Services, ETAB Solutions, easy to set up for your business for online ordering and curbside pickup. CNH also offers cost-effective commercial lending programs. This is key. They can help you get your business the money it needs to make it through these unprecedented, nay, dystopian times. To learn more, contact CNH Financial Services at 855 600 2437 or go to chfs.us. Tonight, my guest, he is Steve Karras. He is a documentary filmmaker. The film in question we're going to talk about tonight about face the story of the Jewish refugee soldiers of World War II. Steve, nice to see you. It's been a, several decades. Well, I did, as I said, I, 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 uh, uh, I ran into you at uh, Marshall Crenshaw and Smithereens show, which was in your, uh, your neighborhood. Uh-huh. Who knew Skokie could rock? So I, the way I, that it did you I, just I was knew well it. aware of that yeah oh yeah uh, yeah but i mean back in the day in radio terms last time i interviewed you was in the 90s i think whenever it must have been in 98 or 99 i i, I it could have been 2000 but i, I have a feeling it was i just been with sourball for uh-huh. a few months and mike datz who is still a very dear friend of mine he um he was uh, very ambitious and extraordinarily talented. And, and Jay Batchko is with us. And, and I remember uh, it's, it's, it's still on. These, tape, are, these are all local musicians of, of yes, great, it, great in skill. In Chicago. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one lives, Mike lives in Los Angeles. Jay still lives in Chicago. But uh, midway through the interview, you said porn. You guys like porn, don't you? <laughs> And it turned into I this said that? awesome. Yeah, it turned into. I don't, I don't remember this. I don't remember this, Steve. Uh, I'm gonna have to send it to you because it was just so. It was fun. It was such a fun time to be in a band in Chicago. So much cool stuff was happening in the '90s. So and we it, talked it was, about porn on the radio. That doesn't sound we, like me. We did, but it, in, in such a way without the cursing. Like you told me that you and your buddies get together and you you make up names for pornos, and. Uh, that's, that's that sounds right. Up. Yeah. And then we all started throwing out names and of, of, of pornos. And, and Jay just said, said the classic one. He said caviar dinner. And then someone, ca- you know, someone corrected him. He said caviar party. <laughs> you know, which is like, I still don't know what it means. You know, like I think you said Ben Hoare. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, 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 yeah. That was me. That was and, me. <laughs> yeah. You said Ben Hoare. And, and I said on Golden Blonde, yeah, which was yeah. actually a film. It, and uh, a, a timeless classic. It really is. It really is. I think it was around that time that I probably was getting bit by the World War II history bug. And 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 it just it, that's when it all started, oddly enough. Yeah, of course. All, all those porn titles <laughs> made you think I'm, I'm going to be a filmmaker. Well, no, that's no, it. It, was the, it was the music. I don't know. No, it was uh, I had already gotten into it. And I think that or I, I had a I had my first straight job at the time, which was working as a as a um, software installer for for a sales team that never made any sales. And it was for some company out of Las Vegas. Um, I won't mention the name, but they, they, they traded on the NASDAQ as P-Pro. And I had all these pre-IPO stocks and uh, pre-stock options, which I vested the week that I got fired from that job. And I was able to cash them. And That's at amazing. that point- yeah, and that's a happy ending is, uh, to an extent, you know, that does, it got me started and hooked up with all the, you know, cool filmmakers that worked on the project. And, uh, and you know, doesn't uh, it, it, it's notwithstanding, you know, my my marriage that fell apart <laughs> you know, later on. Uh, so but that it was all part of from you to, let's say, 2005. It was a glorious time. I'm glad it could be one of those bookends. <laughs> yeah, that no, was on the no, front end now, of it. Now you're on the. You actually have bookended it, but no, I'm I'm being uh, semi-ironic. I did. I do have a nice child out of the out of the affair. Well, that's good. Congratulations. <laughs> no, but we're all over the place. So yeah, it, we we. My connection to you is through 
my uh, my uh, brief sojourn in, in Chicago rock, although I still play, but not in like not, you know, radio friendly sense. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it, it was. It was a wonderful time. And it's nice that we can circle back and talk about something completely different. Yeah, now. absolutely. And it's nice that we can go into this kind of heady discussion about World War II and uh, Germans teaming up with the Allies to fight the Nazis. Nice that we could lead into that with talk of rock and roll and pornography. It, sure, per, sure, sure. Totally normal. Totally well, normal. Well, there there's also a connection because John Cale scored my film. You As know, in the, John Cale. John Kale. Kale, yes. So As that's... Velvet John Underground Kale. is in John that's, Kale. Absolutely, yeah. So um, that's uh, it, it, that was also through another um, Chicago drummer named Bill Swartz, who had actually played on a couple of John Cale uh, demos. And I, I thought, wow, this, you know, John Cale, who I knew about, and I knew that he was such a sophisticated European, you know, or Welshman, same oh, yeah. thing. And I got his number or his email or is his uh, agent's email. And I emailed her, said, you know, would John be interested in being the possible uh, uh, musical score or write it? And that's what, that's exactly what happened. And it's, uh, it cost a lot, but it was worth it. Well, you're answering <laughs> all the questions I was going to ask later on in the interview. The, the score, the work John Cale did, appropriately understated in the documentary. It, yes. It, it, it totally fits tonally. It, it makes sense with the movie, but you never listen and say, oh, that, that's John Cale. It's just, it, it's a really appropriately scored documentary. You do at one point hear the viola it, that sounds exactly like Stephanie says, or, or something that you would have heard in those early Velvets mm -hmm. uh, recordings. I think Stephanie says is uh, John Cale era. So you, you get you get his work back and you hear it. Do you get like goosebumps you hear it. in if here? You're, if you're a fan, I remember thinking, "Oh my goodness!" That's what I'm that's, asking. Like, did, did you just kind of flip? Front, like, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But uh, but I did. I, I remember at first because I have never I'd never made a film. I haven't made one since. It was a long time. And and I'll and I'll talk about you know I had a collaborator, Rose Lizarago, who's here in Chicago, and we both went out there together um she's the, she we produced it she's co-director all this kind of stuff and we both went out to this uh studio in hollywood called radio recorders and it was the old rca recording studio which i think elvis presley had recorded some of his his movie songs like kissing cousins or i don't know if scotty moore ever went into the studios with him there but it was very cool and i i was I didn't know how anything is scored, let alone, you know, my thing. So I, at first I didn't know how to communicate and what I had, you know, what I wanted because he was, you know, messing around with the synth and stuff. And I said, no, I, I think Samuel Barber, because I was thinking of the Adagio for strings that opens the movie platoon. And, and, and I, and then it just, we connected on that front because at first it was, I was not properly communicating. <laughs> you, know? right, you just didn't didn't have that no. experience. Yeah, so and and I'm geeking out because this is like my hero. Sure, he he's an architect of modern music. Period. Uh, uh, yes. Full stop. Absolutely, and still is. He's 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 amazing. So the movie again, you can rent it on Amazon right now. About face the story of the Jewish refugee soldiers of World War II. I I think a lot of us are in documentary mode right now. We, mm -hmm. We've seen, we, we've binged all the TV shows, we've watched all the movies. I think a lot of us are digging into history in this time when we're all kind of sheltering in place and we're trying to contextualize the world around us. Uh, really well-timed release of this movie, I think. I, I'm sure it was coincidental, but... Totally really well coincidental. It's not incidental. You know, we waited nearly a decade for this to uh, to come out. And it would, at first, I remember finishing it and saying i just want it to be in a in a, in a blockbuster you know <laughs> i want someone to be able to rent it that was at the very beginning and then yeah thanks to uh you know video you know streaming i i hooked up with this this distributor out in california called xenon pictures and there's they are the largest repository for black cinema 
And the, 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 prin the principal of the company, Lee Savage, is, uh, was nominated for an Academy Award for Straight Outta Compton. Like he was involved in, this, in the story and bringing it together. And, you know, it's just a strange marriage. And, and at first, you know, we had to change the, uh, what's called the lower thirds on the, on the bottom of the screen. You know, it was just, we had a chance to recut to uh, make a, 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 a 2020 version of the film, which was, which was good, put in the high definition and uh, looks brand new. And it is timely if you want to talk themes. Absolutely. Well, yeah. and it, this answers a question that comes up a lot. And I, someone says it at the end of the movie, all Jews didn't go like lambs to the slaughter. The question of why didn't people fight back? Why didn't people press back against the Nazis? This is, that's part of the story here. I mean, these people who went away from the, went away from and then against their homeland to fight alongside the allies as this Nazi menace was doing all their horrible things. Mm. What inspired you to go down this road? What, because this, this is so much work, literally a decade worth of, of time, investment, yeah. blood, sweat, and tears. Why this, this particular angle of World War II? It really came out of, um, it came, its roots date back to when I was 12 or 13, you know, at summer camp in, in, um, in Wisconsin, when I had one of my, one of my counselors um, tell me that his father had been a, um, uh, one of these refugees that went and liberated one of his, you know, that went to his hometown. His name was Siegfried Dingfelder. His son was Roger Fields. And um, so it, uh, it, it was, it always stuck in my craw. It was something that was so exotic. And I couldn't believe that something like this happened. Can you hang on one second, James? This yeah. is uh, one sec. So it's Carcon Carney. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm, I'm this You're is, still here? I'm still here. I am just turning something on for my daughter. And now oh, I yeah, can I guess. Uh, return. So um, one second. This is how you know it's live. The, the muting of the camera and the microphone, and he's gone again. If you're watching on Facebook Live, thank you for doing it. Uh, Cara Coin Carney, sponsored by c &H Financial Services. Uh, Steve's going to do a little walk through his house. It looks lovely. It looks tastefully appointed. I'd, I'd expect nothing less. Uh, tomorrow night on Cara Coin Carney, I might as well use this time to promote what's coming up on Cara Coin Carney. Tomorrow night, if you join us, Empirical Brewery. Will be talking to us. They're a nerdy brewery on the north side. Love them. Uh, Wednesday, Chris France, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Talking Heads, Tom Tom Club. His new book, Remain in Love, is <laughs> Steve's back and he's making bug eyes. He can't believe I just said Chris France. Uh, his new book, Remain in Love, is a fantastic snapshot of one of the coolest periods of rock and roll history. Talking about the birth of Talking Heads, the evolution of Talking Heads, coming up with the Ramones and Blondie and the B-52s. Just amazing stories. Uh, his ongoing romance and marriage to tina weymouth of talking heads uh, the insanity that is david byrne chris will be joining me on um wednesday and of course more to more to come looks like steve is back with us had to get my little plug in here unmute yourself i said i said uh, what about the kindness of jerry harrison it, it's interesting it's jerry harrison <laughs> doesn't get mentioned as much the, the really? thing i thought i'm going to talk about this with chris france but the thing I thought was really interesting, I didn't know this, Jerry Harrison didn't agree or wouldn't join Talking Heads until they could confirm they had a record deal. Because Jerry was successful with the Modern Lovers. He was already mm -hmm. like a name. He was already a guitarist of renown. And he said, yeah, I'll join your band, but you got to have a record deal first. So Christina wow. and David were doing their thing. They got the deal with Sire, I believe it was. And then Harrison was on board. And then, you know, here, rest is history. I'm proud to say that John Cale produced the first Modern Lovers LP. See, it's it, it all. See, it's it's all it all comes back to the Holocaust. It, uh, yeah. So, but no, but to answer to what I was going to say, the roots are is me as a kid, and I remember that. Uh, do you remember that miniseries, The Holocaust, that had come out? Sure. It was. Um, it was pretty. It, it, there was a moment in that. This was in the '70s. This is with like Fritz Weaver and. And um, uh, I think Sam Bottoms was in the film and all these interesting people. And there was a section about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which 
I think at the time and the way they presented it wasn't exactly uh, how it happened, but it was Jewish people, victims of the Holocaust that were actually fighting back. And when I'd heard about this, uh, this uh, gentleman, um, Fred Fields, who had been Siegfried Zingfelder, um, it, 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 it kind of, it stuck in my mind because I, I always wanted to hear more stories like this. And, you know, apart from like a, like a, a scant, you know, reference to it in a book or uh, someone that I might have met along the way, uh, it wasn't, you know, there, I didn't have many, you know, in the aggregate to choose from to go out and start interviewing them. And this is, you know, back in 99 or 2000 when I got the idea. But um, so it was just this ongoing interest that was never satisfied. And when the internet came out, uh, uh, probably around, no, I mean, it, probably a couple of years before I met you, um, I somehow, I, I just, for fun, I put the, an ad on the, or some kind of message board for World War II. And one, a veteran got a hold of him. Mind you, these were like 79, 80 year old guys right. back then. Most of them are gone. So in retrospect, I'm blown away by how many uh, were, were internet savvy at the time and had email address. And there's a gentleman in the film, he's actually not in the movie, you hear his voice in the answering machine messages in the very beginning of the film. And he uh, was a, a survivor with his own amazing story. His name was Leo Bretholtz. And he, he, was, he actually jumped out of a, a freight train bound for Auschwitz, got out. And, and he wrote a book called Leap into Darkness about his, his, his odyssey after escaping a, a train out of, out of um, Gurs, France. I think or Gers was where the uh, the um, the transit camp was, and so he hooked me up in one afternoon. I think I'd come back from work and had all of these answering machine messages. Like I was wondering accents. how you got got hold of all these people and like knew how to how to find them. Or it, it, it was sounds word like they found you. Yeah. Yes, it was word of mouth, and then we had some press, and then uh, like the old what's that old commercial, and so on and so on. Uh, was that a shampoo commercial? I, I think it remember. was. Yeah. All right. So uh, Fabergé or something like that. So um, I it, look, there's, I still hear about people. I, I'll come in contact with someone who, oh, that was my, that describes my grandfather. And so and I would have kept interviewing people. In fact, I did that for two years of going around the country, interviewing folks before. Um, and I'd set up a foundation Then I hooked up with Rose and we, uh, she said, it's time to, you know, stop interviewing people. Let's, let's put this thing together. And because at first, you know, I had a general vision, but then you become attached to some of these individuals. Most yeah. of them, you can only put 15 people in a documentary to make it uh, compelling. Right. And some have good stories, but don't know how to tell it. And that also, while I waited for the, the, the documentary to, to, to come out, I, I, I wrote a companion book, which contained full interviews, transcribed, uh, or edited memoirs. And I, you know, I took a, took a shot at that. So I'm mostly concerned and consumed with the actual subject. You know, I haven't, uh, I, you know, this, this should be a, a, a warning for prospective filmmakers or ones who, uh, just make another film. Don't don't wait for it to, to get distribution. If you're a right. filmmaker, make another film. Or you know, if you write, what's there's an old uh, I, I think Elvis Costello once said like you get like uh, 18, 19 years to make your first record, and then seven months to make your second one. Well, I feel uh, that I waited a long time, but it was the subject that was so uh, so compelling, and also a feeling that you owe uh, owe these people to tell their stories. I get that. Yeah. So it's, 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 but again, it's a gift that keeps giving because I, I have spoken about it. I've had little screenings over the last several years and the book and I've had some radio. So it's, it's something that I'll never tire of talking about, especially when people like you and others uh, will say, I've never, I never knew this happened. Well, you know, these are, it, this is the best kind of revisionism. Yeah. It, it is one of those aspects of world war II We never really heard much about. And that's 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 the hook. I mean, that's that's the fascinating part of all this. 
talking about the people you interviewed, it's got to be that generation. What a bunch of charming guys you talk to. Uh, oh, yeah. Just mag magnetic smiles, engaging personalities. What an interesting group uh, of people you had the fortune to talk to. Yeah, two of those gentlemen uh, I interviewed on the same day. The one that we went back to um, Germany with, Ludwigshafen, his name is Eric Hamburg. And I, I think he might still be alive, actually. And, and then when I was done with his interview, this is in New Jersey, it was in Union, New Jersey. And I said, I, this was the great, this is the best interview. Nothing, I, I can't imagine doing another interview today. And we just reluctantly went to the next place. I was tired. And that was the most engaging interview, Carl Goldsmith. And he's the one that uh, I know that you're, he's one of the guys that you're talking about. He passed away, but he's the one uh, who, who ended the film when he says, I'm just a flag waver, you know? just these beautiful blue eyes and he was so yeah. nice. And, and again, it's just like, that's what kept the momentum is just the connection with these guys. I didn't get that with Kissinger, <laughs> yeah, but who, he was, he was nice. <laughs> that, was, that was a nice score for interview subject. Yeah. He said, thank you for, uh, thanks for not giving me a hard time. You know, like when I, when I went in there, he, he said, uh, you've got, uh, you've got 20 minutes. I said, I thought you get 40. I thought I got 40 with you. He says, you could negotiate the other 20. Which was, so, which was so spoken weird. like a true former Secretary of State. Ab absolutely, but that was the same week that the Christopher Hitchens book came out called "The Trials of Henry Kissinger." <laughs> Not, yeah, you know. It, so that was, uh, I think, he was entirely pleased that someone was coming up to not talk about uh, uh, some some dubious right. things in his, in his in his past. Dubious, maybe from his point of view, but from not for the rest of the people that. Uh, had bad things to say about him. You know, it, watching these stories, hearing these these re, re, memories, remembrances, it's it's hard to even imagine putting yourself in the context of what these guys lived through. I mean, back then the British government took in ten thousand children. Can you imagine? And, can, and, and this is a rhetorical. I'm not asking you, Steve, but just in general, can you imagine having to send your kids off, knowing, yeah, you'll probably never see them again? get them the hell out of the country and just hope that they'll survive and, and live, live to tell the tale someday. I think that question that you just said uh, never resonated with me until I had a child of my own, who's yeah. now at the age that some of these parents sent the kids off. And uh, I, I don't think I could, I don't think I could imagine that. Honestly, it, it is uh, unthinkable. It, it, I, I can't wrap my head around it. I mean, how horrifying. And it was, I mean, when you're faced with an extreme situation, you have to make an extreme decision. It's, it's an extreme consequence. And that's the decision these people made. But holy crap. Yes. In fact, I remember there's a, I, I, I had sort of a chip on my shoulder because uh, I'm going to show people that, you know, Jewish people didn't go like lambs to the slaughter. And there's wonderful stories of heroism and everything. And I was only thinking in terms of an armed struggle against, you know, Nazi Germany. And Michael Berenbaum, who is one of the executive, is the executive producer, or one of them of the film. He was also the historical advisor, and he appears in the film. He broke it down for me, which was actually kind of a, a lesson because I hadn't considered. He said, "Look, heroism comes in so many different forms," and he did say those parents who sent their kids off not knowing if they'd ever that took so much courage. Oh, yeah an enormous amount that you couldn't possibly imagine. And, uh, and until I had a child of my own, I think history resonates so much deeper than, than uh, it would if I didn't. And that's not to say that you can't appreciate that, but I couldn't imagine uh, A, having to explain what's going on in the world. Right. It's even, it, and I'm getting a feel, I, I get a feel for that now. It's hard to explain what's going on in the world beyond uh, the COVID, which none of us could really explain because it's happening right now, uh -huh. but uh, just just the, the whole tenor of, of political discussion, which is pretty extreme right now. And uh, luckily, you know, she just, you know, she likes watching uh, videos on YouTube, but nothing, uh, nothing controversial in, in the, you know, the the thing the the subject of race doesn't get talked about because it's just she doesn't know about those things yeah. nor you know 
I'm raising her the way I was raised in a, in a profoundly liberal household where it was just not discussed because we just know we knew right from wrong. And then my high school, high school experience, which was so multicultural that uh, I just, I wish that upon every kid who, who's, uh, who's growing up right now. So they don't have this, uh, you know, they, they don't have to kind of tap into the narrative of just this totally imperfect country that's, that's, uh, that's uh, wrought with racism, which, you know, I personally don't believe, but that's a whole different story. That's not to say that there's an incredible amount of racism, but it's not, it doesn't define us. And I, and I really think that after studying so close, like the, the topic of Nazi Germany and, and, and uh, what went on with people who lost their citizenship, there's definitely, you could definitely find correlations nowadays with what's going on, but it's not exactly that. And it makes me, it, it, it engenders more of my appreciation for this country because we've, it's, 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 I think it's basically good although very flawed. Of course. Very flawed. What else? You went into making this movie, doing these interviews, probably with some, some idea of how things would shake out, how the conversation would go, what you'd learn. What were those surprises? What were those things you learned that you hadn't been expecting? What were those things that you thought, wow, I'm glad I made this movie because of this? Well, it's interesting. I almost wish you asked her this asked this question prior to my last response, but it's actually it's it's good to piggyback on it. Um, the uh, I was going for the great revenge story, and it never happened. There would be things I, I start. I think ten to twelve or fifteen interviews into it, I said, "Wow, I'm not getting this sense of hatred, and I'm not getting this sense of." Uh, revenge i'm finding people that had this great fortune of getting out in the 30s some as late as 1941 before the american involvement in world war ii that they weren't imbued with this sense of uh uh hostile revenge as as much as they were wow i'm grateful to have been led into this country and oh my god i'm not getting any anti-semitism in the streets like i did in germany and wow, I, I can't enlist, but they did draft me and I became a citizen. And so I felt that there was this overwhelming positivity going on. And I saw, and I, and I certainly knew by getting to know them that their post-war lives uh, were, uh, they, they, I, I got the feeling that those who were very successful and most of them were, uh, you know, success maybe as a parent, if, if, if at the very least, but uh, but good you know business owners good citizens, and they really lived up to whatever expectations were were uh, were made of them. And so I got gratitude over uh, uh, revenge, and that kind of set my that 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 was a huge lesson to me. It still is. It actually taught me that God, I should be a little more positive as opposed to just focusing on what uh, one of my history professors called lacrimose uh history you know where you're just focusing and that's a big word you might have to look it up lacrimose yeah it's like a lacrimose sense of history where it's it's uh about uh how you've suffered and how you know what i mean it's like i don't i was raised by people who didn't really drum into the fact that uh, drum drum into me that we're hated this is an anti-semitic world this is something that's uh you're gonna to have to fight your way out of schoolyards. So fortunately, I haven't had that that experience. But I also saw that these guys were more, uh, and women were more uh, inclined to talk about the good things. And I even saw in their body language that they were just they would get so excited. Naturally, when you're talking about not being able to see your parents again, that's a different story. So it's it's a bittersweet experience, and uh, it's something I'm still learning about. Lacrimose, adjective, tearful or given to weeping, as in, she was pink-eyed and lacrimose. Thank you, Steve. We, we've is learned that, a lot. <laughs> we've I, learned a lot. Yeah. If anything, if you don't agree with anything that I said tonight, lacrimose. That's it. That, that, that says it, it may, all. It'll, it'll, hopefully, it'll replace uh, the word iconic, which I think is just way too uh, abused. Oh, you know a word I hate? Legendary. He's oh, a legend. Yeah. She's a legend. They're a legend. What, that movie's a legend. What about an icon? Icon's bad too. 
but I feel like legendary status has been ascribed to a lot of people who don't really deserve to be called legends. A little well, premature. If, I, I, you know, I find that you're a legend. Stop it. Stop I, I mean, it. I, I'm excited. I'm still excited. You talked about, okay, so you got John Cale to score it. Yes. You, you got Kissinger to talk. One of the hardest things, I mean, for me, just as someone who sources audio and, and spends the day scouring for content, gathering all the footage footage to use in this documentary, whether it's the marches through France, the shakedowns in the street, the, the moments of brutality we see in, in vivid black and white, I, I've got to think that that's, that's a full-time job as a documentary filmmaker in and of itself, just gathering all that stuff. Well, we all, I think that four or five, I had a wish list of things that I want, and then we set to uh, uh, getting other people involved. We were, I think three of us went to Washington, or four of us, and we went to the different archives. Now you could source all this online. Yeah, that's true. I even, I even found, though it's not in the film, I found the actual footage of one of the uh, veterans who nego he didn't nego he translated the surrender of the entire uh, forces of southern germany under uh, field marshal kesselring and he's in the uh, uh, john brunswick who was in the film was that lieutenant that was translating it and i found the newsreel footage of it just wow. didn't it just didn't it it didn't fit it was fine the way we had it but that was another thing you know in the not even the 11th hour, this is a decade later, I found this footage. If anything, I was able to tell his family about it. I found it, I found it. And this, it that, was, that was gratifying. And it's interesting, these guys who, who came over here, the, these Germans who came to America, fought among the allies, they changed their names. I mean, like they, their entire lives were upended and turned into a different direction than they ever would have imagined. It's just, it's a fascinating story. And again, it's one that's not really been told to any great detail. Um, About Face, the story of the Jewish refugee soldiers of World War II. It is rentable uh, on Amazon Prime. Uh, it took you 10 years to make it. Was that longer than you'd expected? Way longer. Well, <laughs> it, I started in 20, I think in 99. The first interview was in November or October. Second one was in around that time. And here I am, I'm back. Um, so, uh, and, and ironically, not even ironically, it's just very sad that one of the, the second men I interviewed, Otto Stern, uh, his grandson was, was killed in Iraq uh, in 2005. Just, he, he too was a lieutenant. So I think he might, he, he was definitely proud of his grandfather and wanted to uh, fulfill his patriotic chore. Um, under different circumstances. His name was Andrew Stern. He was from, uh, I think he grew up in Buffalo Grove. And then they, the family moved to, uh, to uh, Nashville. But um, it, I think we finished cutting the film in, I think in 2006. And then I returned to it in the last year to, to, to fix some of the titles, cut some of the things out. And and that was it, you know, I've, I've, it's, this was, it's coming to market. What is uh, Will Ferrell saying the thing you know, about his plums, you know, getting ready for market, you know, <laughs> so it's, do you know what I'm talking about? I kind of. Yeah. All right. All right. From East Bound and Down. Um, hang on. Sorry about that. Uh, so that's, uh, we finished in 2006 and then it becomes a full-time job to try to get it seen. Yeah, then it's and a hustle. Then it's a hustle. Then you move on to other projects, and it's never really been. And, and I think it became more relevant in the last couple of years. It's almost it, it, it. The time timing is everything, and I think that it came out now for a reason. And one I, of the last lines of the of the film is, "Don't let a fanatic get a hold of your country." There Draw it is. Draw your own conclusions. So someone rents it tonight, uh, again, or this week, about face, the story of the Jewish refugee soldiers of World War II. What do you want them to walk away feeling? Well, if they buy it, I'll come over and do their laundry for That's not true. That's not yes. true. Yes. If Don't they're in Chicago, that. I will, you know. That's not true. Um, ask the question again, because I got what, thinking what, about laundry. What, what kind of emotion or feeling do you want someone to walk away with after watching the movie? That, um, that's a good question that 
the world has been much worse. The world's been much worse and um, that history is, 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 is fraught or, or with, there is the sadness, there is the tragedy, but there are moments of, of, of heroism and ones that we could still draw intense gratification from and inspiration. And that's, that's what I want people to take away. It's not a revenge film. It's, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very inspiring movie. I think. I agree. I agree. Uh, all right, Steve, thank you. I'm going to say goodbye to Facebook live. Thank you everybody for watching there. Much thank appreciated. You. Uh, see the movie again about face the story of the Jewish refugee soldiers, of world war two. It's a mouthful, but there you go. We'll just say about face. And uh, thank you for watching. On thank Facebook you so live. much.